Good morning and welcome to worship for Slateville and Slate Ridge Presbyterian Churches. This is for July, no, January 23rd. Um, it's hard to imagine we're running through January this quickly. Um, for those of you that, if you're thinking about it, on the 23rd, we will be having Slate Ville's congregational meeting. We are gonna start the service about 15 minutes early. We'll do the congregational meeting immediately following the service, and I can do my part, and then head to um, Slate Ridge for their worship, and um, you will finish up with a corporation meeting. Um, next week, Slateville, nah, Slate Ridge will be having its congregational meeting at the end of worship. So just so you can think about it, and if you want to be a part of that, you may be there. If you would, join me in our call to worship and our opening prayer. Loud talkers and silent warriors, glad handers and lonely wallflowers, God gathers us together to be the body of wonder and joy, of hope and healing. Bystanders with hands shoved into our pockets, frady cats whose feet are frozen in place. Jesus calls us to carry grace to outsiders, to walk with those left behind. Kids who never offer answers in class, bashful folks whose tongues tie in knots. The Spirit anoints us to speak up for the voiceless, to partner with the poor, to discover their gifts. Let us pray together. Gracious God, our day, every day sings of your glory. Each night lullabies us to sleep. And in every moment between, your grace pulls us to your heart. More than any prize we may win, we long for the riches of your joy. More than all the world's empty calories, we hunger for the fullness of your love. More than all the fears that surround us, we embrace the, the peace of your heart. Amen. And join me in our call to confession and prayer of confession. We are afraid to join hands with others. We want to listen to those who speak falsely. We glibly offer silliness to those we love the most. Let us share with God how we have not been the body we were made for, that God might reshape us into his holy community. Let us pray together. Do we make you laugh or weep, gracious God? We sing that we are one in your spirit, but cannot tolerate those who disagree with us. We talk about being one body, but fight over music or Bible versions or carpet colors. We affirm the giftedness of each person, but we heap honor on a special few. Forgive us, creative God, that we dismember your body so easily. May the words of our mouths speak peace to the brokenness in our world. May the hopes of our hearts bring wonder to those in despair. May our love embrace all who are around us. Forgiven, we are filled by God's Spirit, commissioned to be Christ's hope, Christ's people for the world. Anointed, we can care for one another, weep for one another, serve one another, and live with one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I'm going to be reading a passage that you are probably fairly familiar with. Um, it is Jesus's um, his statement as to what his ministry is going to be all about. This comes immediately 
after he has been in the desert for 40 days, uh, tempted by Satan. Listen for the word of God. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout the surrounding country. And he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to him, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Spirit, come upon us as you have in days and years past. We need your empowerment. We need your courage. Touch us, we pray. Amen. As you know, in the early chapters of the book of Acts, Luke tells us that the Holy Spirit came upon those first believers at Pentecost and launched the Church of Jesus Christ. In our passage this morning, he tells us that the Holy Spirit's involvement in the life of Jesus as he steps into his public ministry. Now, Luke is, as you know, only one of two gospel writers who say anything about Jesus' birth. Luke is the only one who says anything about Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple on the eighth day for circumcision, and then years later, they come to the temple for Passover, and Jesus disappears for a couple days to have a little chat with the leaders of the temple. And then, almost 30 years later, as Jesus is, to about, is about to begin his ministry, we have the story of his baptism, where the Holy Spirit depend, descends upon him like a dove, Immediately after his baptism, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan to choose a different path, an easier way. And then as Luke reports, Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, returns to Galilee, and we find him again in the temple, as was his custom. For Luke, all three episodes are Holy Spirit's stories as the Spirit claims, tests, and empowers Jesus for the mission and the ministry that lies ahead. Luke wants us to know that it is the Holy Spirit who leads Jesus to say no to those false options in the temptation story and yes to the mission given to him by God. When Jesus read the Isaiah 61 passage in the synagogue of his hometown in Nazareth, he declared that his ministry as the Messiah of God called him to be an agent of mercy to a broken world. He will bring good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed and the source of new, for new beginnings for all who have failed. It is almost as if Jesus is making his mission statement front and center as he begins his public ministry. And if you read further on in that section of Luke's gospel, Jesus tells the people that God's good news is going to be very different 
from what they had might be expecting. And at first, the people responded warmly to those gracious words that Jesus spoke. <clears throat> but they soon realized that they didn't care very much for what he was saying. And the person saying these troubling things was someone they knew. They knew Mary and Joseph. They had seen this boy grow up. Many had stopped to visit him in the carpenter shop. But when Jesus pressed the issue, noting that a prophet is not honored in his hometown by his own people, their questions turned into resentment and at last into open violence. By the end of the story, the people had all but rejected Jesus and took him to the edge of the cliff to kill him. But as Luke reports, Jesus passed through the midst of them. As you know, Jesus' ministry flourished and grew. It really grew after his death and resurrection, continuing even to this present day. And as we view what is happening around the world, this 21st century might well prove to be the greatest century for our Christian faith. But how can that happen? How can the cross of Christ, as our hymn puts it, tower over the wrecks of time? It is because, as Jesus said, he is the fulfillment of all that was said in the Old Testament. Those first Christians and even those first gospel writers saw him as the fulfillment of prophecy. They had studied the prophets. They had studied the Old Testament and heard it expounded on by the, their rabbis. And they waited for the one who would fulfill all these grand expectations. And then they looked at the Old Testament alongside their own personal experience of Jesus and discovered that Jesus was right. He was the fulfillment. He, but he was far more than just a fulfillment of prophecy. The glory of Christ is this. He is the fulfillment of our greatest human longings and need. We discover, as the, did those first Christians, that Jesus is the fulfillment of our lives. Our Christian faith does not stand or fall on the trustworthiness of the four Gospels. Now think about that. The Gospel, the good news, was preached before a single word was ever written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. For a full generation, the only Gospel, the only good news they had was their personal experience of Jesus. It wasn't until some 30 to 40 years later that people like Mark and Paul started to write about their experience of Jesus. And then decades after that, Matthew and Luke added some insight to what had previously been written. Luke even states that at the very beginning of his gospel, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled, there's that word again, fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the very first to write an order, orderly account for you, my most excellent Theophilus. Now, we don't honestly know who Theophilus was. He might be an individual, or he might be a group of people. Theophilus means beloved of God or loving God. So Luke could very easily have been writing to people like you and me and not just one person. But please hear me. Our Christian faith has been conveyed to us in the scriptures. 
and we cherish and we honor the Bible. We are grateful that we have a written record of the faith we so firmly believe. But as great as those scriptures are, they would not convince us if it were not for the fulfillment of scripture that we have seen throughout the world in literally millions upon millions of lives. But more importantly, you and I have experienced that same fulfillment in our lives. Do you remember what the people of Samaria said after hearing about Jesus from the woman at the well? They said, we believe now, not because of what that woman said, but because we ourselves have heard him and we know that he really is the savior of the world. This is our claim today. Jesus is the fulfillment of our deepest longing and our deepest human need. St. Augustine said that human beings have a God-shaped emptiness or void inside each of us that only God can fill. Jesus fills that void in every single one of us. He proclaimed today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. As the body of Christ, I can't help but wonder to what degree we are fulfilling scriptures in the lives of others. Those of us who have experienced the glory of Jesus want to extend that benefit to everyone we meet. You and I are agents of the good news today. And some of it we do through the work of our church. Some of it we do personally, one to one, as we extend God's love and kindness to people in need. God gives us no other day than today to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and new beginnings for all who have failed. Jesus went forth in the power of the Holy Spirit as an agent of God's mercy to the broken world. As followers of Christ today, we have that same call and that same power. Praise be to God. Amen.
as we gather for a time of prayer, um, there have been any number of deaths in our area, in our life. Um, we just buried Carter Seibel and ask that you keep Cindy and family in prayer. Um, you have joys and wonders that are just a part of your hearts and minds. Um, let's bring them all to Almighty God as we pray together. Let us pray. We give all glory to you, O God. You are the one whose generosity extends to all creation. You offer your love and your gifts to all your children. And we do give you thanks for all the blessings and for all your gifts that you have bestowed upon us. You have given us all that we need to live fully in your realm. You've given us prophets and seers, priests and kings. But more importantly, you have given us your son that we might know of your great love. You have blessed us with gifts so we can share your love with others. Lord, for all these blessings and all those that we haven't mentioned here, we give you thanks. And we do lift to you those who are on our hearts. We know your love reaches out to them and to all your children, but we want to share our hurts and our concerns with you. We want our prayers and our love to be part of your healing presence in their lives. So wherever and whenever possible, help us to be your words and your acts of love to those around us in need. We join our voices now in the prayer that you gave to all your followers saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us go now as praying, witnessing people. Our words and our actions will release captives. What we do and say will change our world. So in quiet confidence, we dare to change and grow in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.